story of people pleaser and people pleaser DAO and X times Y equals K, the Uniswap animation that came out announcing Uniswap V3. This is such a crazy story. Uh, so let's go ahead and get right into it. This is going to be something new. There's a, a mixture of media is going on in here. We got me reading this article that I put out on the Bankless newsletter today. We got uh, short interviews with Leighton Cusack, who uh, started People Pleaser DAO. Uh, and then we also a 20, a 20 minute interview with um, uh, People Pleaser towards the end, along with a few clips. And we're also going to put some gifts in here as well. So we're, we're experimenting with new media formats here on Bankless. But before we do, we're going to take a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Aave is a borrowing and lending protocol on Ethereum and just recently released Aave version 2, which has a ton of cool new features that makes using Aave even more powerful. With Aave, you can leverage the full power of DeFi, Money Legos, Yield, and Composability all in one application. On Aave, there are a ton of assets that you can deposit in order to gain yield, and all of those same assets can also be borrowed from the protocol if you have deposited collateral. Here you can see me getting a 200 USDC loan against my portfolio of a number of different DeFi tokens and ETH. I'll choose a variable interest rate because it's a lower rate than the stable interest rate option, but I could choose the stable interest rate option if I wanted to lock that interest rate in permanently. One of Aave's V2 features is the ability to swap collateral without having to withdraw your assets, trade them on Uniswap, and then deposit them back into Aave. Aave does all of this for you all in one seamless transaction, so you don't have to repay loans in order to change the collateral you have backing them. Check out the power of Aave at Aave.com. That's A-A-V-E.com. Gemini is the world's most trusted cryptocurrency exchange. I've been a customer of Gemini since I first got back into crypto back in 2017, and it has been my main exchange of choice to make my crypto buys and sells. Gemini is available in all 50 states and over 50 countries worldwide. And on Gemini, there are markets for over 30 various crypto assets, including many of the hot DeFi tokens like Wi-Fi, Aave, Uni, and also they are one of the few exchanges that has liquid die markets. Having both the option of logging into the Gemini.com website or instead opening the Gemini mobile app has allowed me to be able to access any and all exchange and on or off ramp services that I've needed to on a moment's notice. With instant deposits and fast withdrawals, I'm able to make my money do the things I want it to when I want it to. You can buy crypto safely and securely on Gemini with the peace of mind of knowing that your investments are insured and protected with industry-leading cybersecurity. You can open up a free account in under three minutes at Gemini.com slash GoBankless. And if you trade more than $100 within the first 30 days after signup, you'll be gifted a free $15 bonus. Check them out, Gemini.com slash GoBankless. Let's get into it. The story of people pleaser, people pleaser DAO, and X times Y equals K, and how tokens and DAOs can allow us to focus on what we want. On Monday, March 22nd, the Uniswap Twitter account released a 45 second long animation of a unicorn that walks through a trippy, colorful, seemingly DeFi themed landscape. Let's go ahead and give that a watch. Unicorn, Uniswap's spear animal, walks alongside flowing 3D curves, which are an allusion to Uniswap's X times Y equals K price curve model. The colors used in the animation are influenced by the various tokens that trade on the Uniswap exchange. Life blossoms in the wake of this unicorn, illustrating the creative power that Uniswap and Ethereum bestows upon the world, and is also an allusion to the forest spirit from Princess Momonoki. I don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, which I believe is a shared beloved movie of some of Ethereum's core uh, deepest contributors and the artist people pleaser herself. It seems to be that every single element of the X times Y equals K animation has deep metaphors to DeFi apps, Ethereum culture, and the values it bestows upon the world. 
Here, artist the People Pleaser tells a behind the scenes creation story of X times Y equals K. So let's watch that too. Hey, it's People Pleaser. Here's a behind the scenes of the Uniswap B3 video. The piece titled X times Y equals K tells the story of a unicorn that brings life to this desolate land and awakens all of these elements of DeFi as well as the curves that are featured throughout the animation, which represent the bonding curves. And we see these curves breaking through barriers and ultimately uniting with the unicorn and following the unicorn to find the Ethereum promised land. Khalil and I had bounced some ideas off of each other initially, and then I sketched out a rough storyboard, which then turned into an animatic before fully kicking off production in 3D. Now let's dive into the symbolism of the animation. The overall style and aesthetic uses my signature tune shading look, while the remix of halftone textures are inspired by medieval tapestries, which are essential to the Uniswap aesthetic. Other referenced materials include Mobius illustrations as well as anime, and the opening two shots pay tribute to the forest spirit in Princess Mononoke. Um, taking a closer look at the curves themselves, the colors are sampled from this whole swatch of colors that represent the various tokens, and the sliding segments of changing colors represents the V3 feature where you have the ability to select a certain segment of the Uniswap price curve. The constellation in the last shot represents the Uniswap liquidity pool formation and how they're interconnected but ever-changing. And the effect is done completely in 3D and the spheres are spawned at moving points in space and then lines form or break depending on the distance between two points. And the formation of the final V3 were done separately with inherent particle modifiers and then the opacity is driven with a noise node um, which masks out the rendered pass to give it the final sort of blinking and layered effect. The entire piece took a little over a month to produce and will be tokenized to live on the blockchain this Friday, so feel free to check it out if you're interested in owning it on Foundation. The animation X times Y equals K was put up for bid on March 24th with a, with a starting price of $15,000. And bidding slowly crept upwards, so slowly, but Andrew Kane came and dropped a cannonball of a bid at 100 ETH, which held the top spot in the auction for over 12 hours, which is over the half the length of the auction. Um, but then, just a few hours before the end of the auction, a, the 100 ETH bid from Andrew was uh, outbid by a new entrant into the auction, Pleaser Dow, with 110 ETH. In under 24 hours, a, a Pleaser Dow had been formed specifically to source enough capital to purchase this NFT. The genesis of Pleaser Dow was from this tweet from Pool Together founder Leighton Cusack. Anyone want to create a quick DAO to bid on this when People Pleaser released her animation on Twitter on, on uh, Monday? Pleaser DAO was formed when Leighton decided that he wanted to own the X times Y equals K NFT, but assumed that it was going to sell for too high of a price for what he could afford. He needed a little help from his friends, and there was a lot of interest to be a part of this DAO. Here's DeFi Ted saying, shut up, take my money. Uh, Jameis, I, I joined for sure. Andy, I'm in. Uh, let's go into this quick nine-minute interview with Leighton about the formation of Pleaser Dow. Where did this idea to get a collection of people come from? Like, what was the genesis of uh, People Pleaser Dow? Yeah, I think the, yeah, Pleaser Dow. Yeah, I mean, the genesis was basically really wanting. Personally, I really wanted to have a, a, a piece of this NFT, which I think is an mm -hmm. amazing NFT that represents so much about DeFi. It's it, all in one. Um, and also just knowing that I just made an assumption, like, I'm not going to be able to afford this personally. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> I, just, I just kind of threw it out there as like, Hey, let's try and get some people together who are aligned and like owning this piece of DeFi history. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. The Genesis was, I really want this, but I can't afford it. <laughs> right. So the compromise was, well, we can, I can just get my internet friends to band right. together and we can all buy a share in it. So how did you, how did you get these people, your internet friends to coordinate and like, how did it, how did the coordination happen? I just shared it on Twitter. I just shared the idea. Mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, anyone interested in this? And there was a couple people who responded and said like, yeah, I would be. And so it started with that couple people. Um, it was like, uh, there was like three people. And so we, I, I, so then I started like a group chat on Twitter from that. We set up a, like a telegram group. We basically decided like, Hey, let's all put in a minimum of 10, 10 ETH. You can put in more, mm -hmm. but like minimum of 10 ETH. And we'll try and get enough people to be able to purchase it. And we sort of assumed 
the bidding was already at 100 ETH. And so we sort of mm-hmm. assumed like maybe it would go for like 150, maybe 200. It ended up going for a lot more. But we were like, okay, so we need 10 to 20 people. And so mm-hmm. we just sort of pinged people who we thought were um, would be interested in 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 participating. Right. So it's kind of like a word of mouth organization. It's like, oh, people's like, oh, I guess with this opportunity, perhaps I will do this thing because like, damn, that's already at 100 ETH. I would never buy that myself. But if, right. if, if everyone's just contributing 10 ETH, well, what right. would you say was like the average like contribution size? And how did you guys, how do you guys, even, how did you guys even do accounting? The average contribution was slightly above 10. Certainly the mm-hmm. most people contributed 10. I think one thing that's interesting in Andrew, Andrew Kong, um, I don't know if, if that's how you pronounce his name. I haven't met him in person, but um, he, this is sort of interesting. He had the 100 ETH bid, so we were bidding against him. Right. And so we bid against him, but then what happened was someone, someone in the, in the DAO uh, reached out to him and was basically like, hey, we're making this DAO to bid on it. Why don't you join us? And so Andrew actually took that 100 ETH and put it into the DAO. And if it wasn't for him, we probably would not have had enough to actually right. make the purchase because that was a substantial. So anyways, basically most people contributed 10 ETH, a couple did 20 and 30. And then like Andrew did 100 and I think maybe one other person did like 50. He, yeah, he was going to bet 100 ETH himself, but then he realized that like, well, instead of going into a bidding war, Right. I can just join this DAO. I guess the compromise is that, well, now Andrew has to share this NFT with other people, right. but I would, I would assume he has perhaps like the largest share of the people right. pleaser DAO ownership of that NFT. And so like a bit of a compromise, but now it's part of this cool story where I, like, at least he didn't get outbid or had to pay an even higher amount because he coordinated right. with his internet friends. Yeah. And he did, he had the high bid. He, so he, he placed mm-hmm. hundred bid, and so we outbid him and this idea, which is obviously very crucial to DeFi and Ethereum in general, that like if we collaborate, we can actually do a lot more than competing against each other. The, ultimately, the price uh, turned into a bidding war. And uh, like all good auction mechanisms, the uh, foundation app resets every time a new bid oh. is is accepted. So there's 15 more minutes to set a, a bid. Do you know? So that bidding war, so a- Andrew joined into into the People Pleaser DAO army. You guys have now, yeah. now you guys have more people, more capital ready yeah. to bid more. Who, who was the next bidder that you guys had to bid against? Do you know? We don't know, but they had a lot of ETH. <laughs> they had a lot. And we were like watching because they, they, they had a wallet. They were like dropping ETH in from Tornado Cash. And so we were like, oh man, they just added another 100 ETH. And so, <laughs> you know, that's the thing I'm like blocking. Like you can see all this, right? And mm-hmm. so we're like, oh, it bid incoming. But we just, anytime, I mean, I think they, they probably had to be intimidated, right? Because they're seeing this wallet right. that has tons of people sending ETH into it from all different addresses. And it's like, how do you compete against that? Right. But, Especially when like the, the invitation to the group is open and if but, people are interested, they can find it and just throw in right. their capital. Like how, how are you going to fight against the army of the many? Right. Right. Yeah. We actually wanted to, um, but we, it was just like, we only had like 15 minutes, but we wanted to send them like a message on chain and say like, Hey, come join us. <laughs> um, but, uh, we didn't have time. <laughs> That's hilarious. Don't fight us. Just join us. <laughs> so what's, what's the state of the Dow now? Like how are things organized? As soon as the auction ended, what I did is got four other trusted members of the DAO on a multi-sig and transferred all the ETH and the NFT to the multi-sig. So that's where it resides now. Right. Okay. So what is the future of the DAO? Like, how are you guys going to manage this NFT? You guys are just going to have this multi-sig that owns this NFT and then all the excess ETH is getting returned pro rata to the DAO holders. How is it? How is this going down? Well, that's a great question. I think, you know, as obviously with a DAO, I can't speak for the DAO, but I can speak right. for myself. I can say that I don't think anyone's interested in returning the ETH. I don't think anyone wants their ETH back. I think what people are really excited about is actually growing it. And um, I do think there is a little bit of a niche here with with sort of um, these collectibles or, I don't, you know, collectibles is too trivial of a word. They're really like pieces of history that are specific sort of to DeFi. I mean, people pleaser is, to me, a quintessential DeFi artist, right? Like she's been doing so many videos for so long. Um, and so owning something from her, Uniswap, obviously is a quintessential DeFi protocol. And there's other, there's other artifacts like that that we can continue to collect that are in this um, NFT art, but also sort of intersecting with DeFi uh, category. And so personally for me, I hope that the DAO um, continues collecting these because I think to me, we're building, we're building a museum on chain of financial history and it's going to be 
awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I saw somebody's tweet that they had a people pleaser piece of of art on for for auction somewhere else, and they said, "Oh, I I was trying to figure out why my piece that I forgot that I had for sale was bid on." And apparently, other other artwork by people pleaser was immediately bought up on the on the secondary market after the fact. Was, was that you guys? Well, yeah. So there may be some that was bought up, but some was bought up by DAO members. Yeah. So some mm -hmm. was bought up by DAO members because obviously the name's Pleaser DAO. And again, like, you know, uh, we we think very highly of her art and, and think of her as being really, again, like a quintessential DeFi artist. And so we do want to collect a lot of her art for sure. Um, and also, uh, but also, you know, brought more broadly, these DeFi artifacts that um, are really, again, it's, it's, it's the history in the making and we're kind of collecting it in real time. That's cool. This is such a fantastic story. It's got a little bit of everything. It's got like social organization, spur the moment social organization yeah. using a DAO, uh, a yeah. DAO, uh, and an NFT as a financial asset, like capital allocation and digital art and meaning and, and culture. That's pretty cool. Well, and and also like let's not forget the the philanthropic side of it too. You know, because that is mm, yes, you know, right, of course. Obviously, Obviously, like a huge shout out to a uh, few people pleaser. Like she could have made a lot of money off of this, and she decided to, that to to um, support a cause that's really important right now with all mm -hmm. the racism against um, Asian Americans or just Asians in general. I guess maybe in other countries, but um, yeah. So, anyways, that's that. I think is really cool because that is like that's also Ethereum's ethos in my mind. Right. Right. Uh, did you uh, did you read uh, Vitalik's piece on legitimacy uh, before this event happened by chance? No, I hadn't seen that until you tweeted it. And so, and I actually haven't, even, I read your tweet, but I haven't read the whole thing. Yeah, it, it was, it was so crazy. Like he put out this piece like a week ago about how like NFT, the reason why people are paying so much for NFTs is because versus like, like versus a copycat NFT where copycat NFTs are the same NFT, but one is legitimate and one's not. And he said, well, a way to help gain legitimacy for NFTs is if um, the artist commits to doing something valuable for the world and that yeah. bestows legitimacy upon this NFT. And then Uniswap, like Ethereum's de facto like application that exhibits all of the values of Ethereum, it, uh, runs this NFT that is exactly in line with like this predictive like legitimacy model that Vitalik had. The, yeah. the, the timing of that was just so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll definitely need to read that. Vitalik's always ahead of the curve. <laughs> this is always true, but only by one week this time. <laughs> We're yeah. catching up. <laughs> That's good. Awesome, Leighton. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming on and uh, let me let me record on the YouTube. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna reiterate something that we were just talking about with Leighton, but I wanted to put it in the article as well. Access to the DAO was passed by word of mouth from people who signaled interest. Pleaser DAO was open to anyone who cared enough to voice their interest and ready to contribute. Members of the DAO sent in lots of 10 ETH, and with enough contributions, 110 ETH was sourced to outbid Andrew Kang's 100 ETH bid. But here's where it gets interesting. Instead of entering a bidding war with the DAO, Andrew Kang instead joined forces and sent his 100 ETH to gain membership to Pleaser DAO. Andrew Kang tweeted, Almost got into a bidding war with an army of simps today, but ended up being a part of Pleaser DAO, a first-of-a-kind art DAO dedicated towards crypto art. The future is community ownership. <laughs> with the powers of with the power of a handful of individuals coalescing, Pleaser DAO is now a force to be reckoned with. Only two bidders remained between Pleaser DAO and its NFT. Now that Andrew Kang was part of Pleaser DAO. Bidder number 0x421595 was outpriced by a 165 ETH bid from Pleaser DAO, and that was the second to last bidder. And the last bidder was Vast Rail Poor. Uh, and Vast Rail Poor kept in dropping 100 ETH from Tornado Cash uh, from, uh, into his wallet, which Leighton said that that was kind of like intimidating, right? Like, how much ETH does this guy have? Like, he can just, uh, where's, what is his capital size? How much am ammo does this bidder have at their disposal? But on the other side of things, imagine being Vast Rail Poor, who is bidding against this DAO, who had this open invitation for anyone who is interested in computing, uh, contributing. Like it, it, the DAO had already gobbled up Andrew Kang. Like what? Where? Where were to go next? Like the capitalization of the DAO was only limited by the number of interested parties in joining, and who knows how much total desire there would be to be a part of Pleaser DAO. After a bidding war that kept on extending until the end of the auction, Pleaser Dow slapped down a massive 310 ETH bid, $530,000. 
fast rail poor folded to the power of the DAO, and Pleaser DAO successfully won the auction for the X times Y equals K piece with a $530,000 bid. Thanks to the power of capital formation and the power of permissionless financial tools, the power of the many was able to coalesce and become focused upon a single objective, generating more capital for the desired object than a single alternative opponent. This is the story of group coordination overpowering a single entity. You know, this is this is a symbol, this is a metaphor for all these individuals who were, you know, small fries, but with coordination tools, they could out coordinate the big guy. That is the that is the best metaphor for what Ethereum can do to the world. I think I, I have seen illustrated. All right, so let's get into people pleasers side of the story, the artist people pleaser. On the other side of the story is the artist people pleaser who has an impressive resume of animations both inside of crypto and out. So here's her website with a bunch of her artwork, right? All of her past animations. Uh, and then here's the one that caught my eye, the uh, Diablo 4 cinematic, which I remember watching a couple months ago when it came out. Uh, and I'm a huge Diablo fan. And so finding out that this person just made a Uniswap NFT that sold for half a million dollars was a really cool story. Uh, she also has extensive work making animations for various DeFi teams. You know, here's the Abe uh, animation and the Sushi Swap animation. And she's also done stuff for so many else and, and so many other teams. And now, of course, Uniswap. I had the chance to sit down with People Pleaser and we talked about the creation of X times Y equals K. So let's go into it, that interview as well. Um, but it was, <laughs> I did like work a lot throughout this like month and a half, but mm -hmm. it was like, it was like really fun, which is why I put so many hours into it because okay. I'm having fun. And I'm actually really glad that, you know, the people that I brought on board said that they also had a lot of fun. It's just, everybody had fun making it. And that's, I think that's like the main goal at the end of the day. Prod I think artistic products always come out looking a lot better when people are passionate about what they're doing. And that's, that's something I'm personally very hopeful about with what Ethereum can bring to the world around it is the opportunities to create value that people had fun creating along the way. Um, and I think that's a, this is a perfect manifestation of that. Yeah. The full interview is going to be down at the very end of this, uh, end of this uh, YouTube video. So check that out. Uh, People Pleaser told me the story about how her and Uniswap came to team up to produce X times Y equals K and where the early inspiration for this piece came from. She, Her story shared some very thematic components with what I see going on in Ethereum at large. Finding enjoyment in the collaborative process of creation was a key component of the story. Gaining confidence from her community and from her environment to actually put her work up for auction, right? It's a very like, it's very testing time to have your work just be auctioned. Like it's a testament, like it's like, it's like you're being audited. Like this is how much your market, your market is worth. That's, that's a crazy thing. Yet she said that the environment, the Uniswap team and her community helped her gain the confidence to do that. Uh, also discovering a mechanism in the NFT to create value from her skills and also a desire to help others follow in her own footsteps and achieve similar results. These are all to me things that I see happening in Ethereum all the time. People Pleaser said that she was inspired uh, from a tweet from Cao Wang, uh, who suggested that um, people who have recently made a lot of money in crypto and DeFi should find ways to flex that wealth by helping others financially. And so Cao Wang said, has this tweet, if you made a lot of money playing the markets in 2020, just know that this type of activity contributes very little to society. I say that as a trader and investor, if you want to really brag, brag about how many people you've helped financially. So here's another clip from People Pleaser that we'll go ahead and get into. I really think that there's so much money going around in, in crypto that we definitely have more than enough to sort of distribute it and put it towards something that's like worthwhile. Actually, I was really inspired by um, one of Chow Wang's um, tweets a while back, which I had retweeted, um, which he was talking about. Um, sorry, I don't remember the exact quote, obviously, but he was basically talking about how um, nothing against trading, but just, oh, the act of trading is not necessarily like beneficial to society. Um, so, you know, instead of like flexing on, you know, material goods or something, you should flex on how you've helped other people financially. I did feel very resonated with his tweet. Like his tweet was so inspiring. I was like, oh yeah, I think totally more people should be doing that in the space. And 
um, hats off to people who already are. And uh, I hope that, you know, I'm like, I'm not wealthy myself. So um, I was like, but I have this ability to sort of generate uh, like, you know, using my skill set to generate something that does have value, hopefully, and which turns out it did. Um, and I had always thought about um, wanting to do an NFT drop that was um, committed to charity, but I just never found the right sort of opportunity to. And to be quite honest, I was also a little bit scared to take that leap of faith because doing an auction is scary, right? It's... <laughs> Um, not something like a, this auction thing is not something that I've ever done before, but so I think, you know, with the sort of like support of Unisop, um, I felt a little bit more confident being like, okay, I think, you know, there's going to be at least I knew I had, you know, a, a, um, like a great community that I had always supported and were fans of my work, but I wasn't sure, you know, the valuation of that or anything at all. And so, yeah, this was just crazy. I'm super grateful. And I hope that this will also inspire more acts like this in the future as well. Ethereum's maximum potential to redefine society doesn't stop at permissionlessness or de disintermediated financial services. Ethereum's true potential extends into redefining the culture and people that inhabit Ethereum. In my opinion, Ethereum will truly change the world by inspiring a new cultural disposition in how wealth circulates. While applications like Uniswap and NFTs can help facilitate alternative wealth circulation mechanisms, it is ultimately up to the psychological dispositions of the people that make up this cultural environment in which Ethereum operates. I believe People Pleaser and her work are an exemplar example of these new cultural ethos being found in DeFi and Ethereum. I hope that People Pleaser leads many new artists to come and create in ways that recirculate the value that is generated throughout the world. If Ethereum is going to meaningfully generate uh, change for the, uh, for the world for good, it needs to do more than just build new financial software. It also needs to generate a more positive sum attitude in the people that it enables. And this is what I believe is the power of Ethereum. X times Y equals K was sold for over half a million dollars because it leveraged the best of what Ethereum has to offer. Capital formation using the DAO a financial asset using the NFT, cultural exp expression using the animation, and the market value based on human values, which is the legitimacy, which we're going to get into in, in a second. The permissionless nature of Ethereum enabled a DAO to form under extremely tight time constraints. A tweet was made signaling interest in the forming of a DAO, and, un and in under 12 hours, it had sourced 465 ETH, $800,000, with a singular goal to purchase this NFT. The power of, of Ethereum is the ability to produce attentional focal points. Tokens are things that can receive attention from people, and DAOs are things that can focus attention. Ethereum is a lens that allows for people to focus capital upon objects that they perceive to be valuable. Uh, so this is a little uh, diagram that I hacked together using a, a, an image I found on Google. So we have this camera and a, a, a camera works by focusing light on, upon a, a particular point. So it takes in light from an object that it's trying to focus on and it focuses that light upon the sensor, the sensor of the camera or the film of the camera. And in this case, the metaphor is the film is the people and the object in focus is the asset. And because of the instantiation of the actual piece of artwork in the NFT, it allows people to actually focus on the value of that artwork as the value of the NFT. And all of this is done by Ethereum, right? The Ethereum is the camera. Ethereum is the thing that does the focusing. The power of NFTs is they manifest a specific instance of an object into reality. And that ob object is then associated with a piece of digital art, a digital creation, or some other form of value. The power of DAOs, I kind of just explained this. The power of DAOs is that they facilitate the coordination of like-minded people who have a shared goal that they are all in the individual pursuit of. Because of the DAO, people can combine their energies, their money, their value, or labor in pursuit of a shared goal. The power of Ethereum is that it is a platform that enables the instantiation of objects of desire, tokens, and the desiring objects, DAOs and individuals. And these two separate instantiations have no intermediaries separating them. They can just connect directly. Valuing legitimacy. Just earlier this week, Vitalik wrote in a blog post, the most important scarce resource is legitimacy. 
uh, in which he described, illustrated various examples of how humans, uh, human subjective perceptions of legitimacy is an extremely powerful force. If humanity collectively determines something to be legitimate, it has value. If that thing loses its legitimacy, similarly, it loses its value. So here's a quote from Vitalik's piece. Vitalik is a pattern of higher order acceptance. An outcome in some social context is legitimate if the people in that social context broadly accept and play their part in enacting that outcome. And each individual person does so because they expect everyone else to do the same. Which NFTs people find attractive to buy and which ones they do not is a question of legitimacy. If everyone agrees that one NFT is interesting and another NFT is lame, then people will strongly prefer buying the first because it will have both higher value for bragging rights and personal pride in holding it, and because it could be resold for more because everyone else is thinking in the same way. If the conception of legitimacy for NFTs can be pulled in a good direction, there is an opportunity to establish a solid channel of funding to artists, charities, and others. Some institution, or even a DAO, could bless an NFT in exchange for a guarantee that some portion of the revenues goes towards a charitable cause, ensuring that multiple groups benefit at the same time. This blessing could even come with an official categorization. Is the NFT dedicated to global poverty relief, scientific research, creative arts, local journalism, open source software development, empowering marginalized communities, or something else? Vitalik. This last line is crucial to the story. Vitalik suggests that an NFT can further instantiate its own legitimacy as an asset by committing to donate to some of the revenues generated from its sale to valuable social institutions that are aligned with our human values. Oh yeah. Did I forget to mention that People Pleaser, the artist behind X times Y equals K, is donating 100% of the 310 ETH revenue from the NFT sale to charities supporting AAPI and other minority representation? Yeah, she's doing that. That's pretty cool. All of it's going, all of it's going to, uh, to, to support marginalized communities. And People Pleaser tweets, I've been looking for a way to meaningfully contribute to the NFT space, and this seems like the right opportunity for it. Check out this site in ways that you can help. In my opinion, you could not have orchestrated a better Ethereum story if you tried. Uniswap, an application highly resonant with the values of Ethereum, launches a V3 promotion animation from PeoplePleaser. A new financial asset and NFTs are instantiating the value of this animation. Many disparate individuals co are coming together to get something that they all want individually but need the power of group coordination to access. And then lastly, the bestowing of legitimacy by financial contributions to public goods. This story is a perfect example of what makes me so optimistic about the future that Ethereum can help enable. A world of open financial tools that help fa facilitate human alignment between our cultural values and the market valuation of our assets. So congratulations to People Pleaser for producing something worth $529,000. Congratulations to a Pleaser DAO for winning the piece. And congratulations to both groups for donating all that money to marginalized communities that don't have access to the crazy upside that crypto brings. And of course, congrats to Uniswap for inspiring it all. And now a final message to Pleaser DAO. Let me in the DAO. <laughs> I want in. Uh, please consider me finding a way to get me in the DAO. I want in. This, this is a fun experiment. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening uh, and watching on the Bankless YouTube. And uh, cheers. All right, guys, let's get into the full-length interview with People Pleaser. But first, before we do, let's take a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. If you are looking for a product that connects your fiat bank account with DeFi tokens and products, you need to download the Dharma mobile app. Dharma is a non-custodial smart contract wallet and comes with a bridge that connects you right into your bank account. Dharma is the fastest and most efficient wallet between your fiat in your bank account and any token on Uniswap or even any vault in Yearn. With Dharma, you can get over $25,000 per week into the DeFi universe and you can do it non-custodially. If you or anyone you know is hot on DeFi and you're trying to get your money into a DeFi investment, Dharma is the place to go. Signing up and going through KYC is an absolute breeze. It took me just under three minutes. And after signing into my bank account via Plaid, I am now just one transaction away from any token that Uniswap has to offer. Go to www.dharma.io. That's D-H-A-R-M-A dot I-O. Download the Dharma app and get yourself unbanked today. If you want to live a bankless life, you need to get a monolith DeFi Visa card. 
Monolith is both a one-two punch of an Ethereum smart contract wallet, as well as an accompanying Visa card that lets you spend the money that you have in your Ethereum wallet wherever Visa is accepted. It's really a fantastic tool that lets you use Ethereum for what it does best, which is holding and managing your financial assets, but also keeps you connected to the rest of the world's payment rails. Monolith also offers on-ramp services for getting your fiat money into the world of DeFi. So it's trivial to top up your Monolith card if ever you need to, and your deposited money goes straight into your non-custodial wallet. So your money is never held by a centralized intermediary because your Monolith wallet is native to Ethereum. Monolith helps you transcend both the legacy and the crypto worlds because the money that you hold in your Monolith wallet has the power of DeFi behind it. Swapping assets on Uniswap or earning yield in DeFi is at your fingertips. But with Monolith, so are the groceries at your grocery store or the coffee at your coffee shop. Go to monolith.xyz to sign up and get your Monolith Visa card. Oh, uh, congratulations on the sale. How does it feel? Uh, how does it feel to have raised over half a million dollars? Well, obviously, I mean, it feels good. I'm just, it feels surreal almost. Like I don't, mm -hmm. hasn't really like sit in yet. Other than that, there's like a huge pile of ETH like sitting in my wallet <laughs> right now that um, myself and the Uniswap team are going to link, mm -hmm. you know, figure out how we're going to allocate the funds. And then we'll post a follow up on Twitter about it with all the details and stuff. So and how did you and the Uniswap team come to be? How did you guys meet? Um, Tarun Chitra texted me a, a while ago. It was in January. Um, he texted me and then he was like, Hey, somebody from Uniswap just messaged me asking if um, you'd be open like to working with them. And I was like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Let's go into the process of like how the symbolism for the in the in the in the piece X times uh, Y equals K actually came about. Um, was that all all your creative work or was there like a back and forth with like maybe Hayden or people on the Uniswap team? Like how, like the, obviously the unicorn would be a, a core feature, but there's so much more in there as well. Tell us about that process. It's mainly, there's just a chat that has me, um, Hayden, uh, Teo and um, Khalil. So Teo is the strategy lead at Uniswap and then Khalil is a designer at Uniswap. And then so initially actually Khalil had spoken to me about making several different like short um, animations or like going through the, the concepts of V3. Um, but then it's like, eventually we decided to sort of just do like the one sort of hero um, mm -hmm. teaser video because at least like my, my approach with these things is um, they're always like, as you probably noticed, like not, not so literal and um, they're like more abst on the abstract side of things, like abstract with a meaning, obviously, like, you know, I always, um, everything in my videos always mean something, but it's not maybe immediately obvious to the viewer, um, which I think is part of why people find the videos fun, I guess. It's like a little Easter egg hunt or something, right? Um, but yeah, so, and so eventually, you know, we kind of decided like, well, there's some really technical um, explanations about, you know, like um, features of Uniswap V3 that, you know, require very, very literal um, animation videos, which, um, you know, also came rolled out later, you know, on, on Wednesday with that blog right. post. And I mean, that was your still, work as well? No, no, no. So okay. that was, um, some, but they still looked incredible and mm -hmm. helped people understand the concepts, which I think was really great. And then, so I was able to sort of, sort of just focus on the one like hero launch video. Um, and yeah, so then since that like decision was made, then I was a little, I I had like way more sort of like room to just expand creatively and then just sort of do what I always do. Um, and so there were definitely a lot of like uh, brainstorms back and forth, you know, between Khalil and I about, uh, initially we had just talked about, you know, something that involves, because you know, one of the main features is how uh, like the, of the bonding curve is now sort of like modifiable or, you know, like customizable mm -hmm. essentially. And then, so, you know, we discussed maybe concepts involving like, um, maybe like a power user that's like uh, morphing something or, you know, like just something that's like, you know, like involving a user and like manipulation of the, the curve itself. Or, you know, and we even threw out crazy ideas like, what if we had like a landscape and like somebody was like, you know, like morphing the landscape or something. And then the actual video came into fruition because 
Khalil had showed me this uh, short story um, and it was like about uh, just like a magical forest or something. And I, I just like, I really felt inspired by that short story. And also, you know, when like he showed it to me, I was just seeing like, um, you know, like images in my head um, already. Like I mentioned in the video, Princess Mononoke was, you know, like high priority, like visual references for me because it's one of my favorite videos. Uh, I'm sorry, movies. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so then it kind of like in my head started to come together at that point. And then, um, so then I, I was like, okay, let me like sketch up a storyboard and then we can talk about it. And then so pretty simple, like four frames. I had meant for it to just like, here's just a rough like four frames and then we can talk about it. But then it actually just ended up being like, I guess these four frames work as each like individual shots. And then so, so yeah, um, that's kind of like how it came about. And then obviously all the other like smaller details and stuff are, um, so that was like, you know, the sort of like the skeleton of the video. And then the other small details, you know, usually come up like, as I'm doing production or something, you know, they're like, they always, it's always like a, an ongoing process, right? Like, you know, you literally be walking outside and then you're like, well, I have this idea or, you know, like mm -hmm. even up until the last minute when, when I'm like editing or something, you know, like, like in the week, like leading up to when the video is about to be released, uh, there could be like new ideas and um, sort of like, yeah, like for example, the, the idea with um, like, so Khalil had said that the Uniswap team were, uh hoping for like the the curves to be like um you know like more than just like one color and then um from that input I decided to like instead of just making like individual like strands different colors but why not also integrate like the fact that the colors are like sliding which is sort of reflecting that kind of uh which section on the bonding curve like we're gonna choose her to provide your liquidity so yeah, like, and that was like super late in the process as well. And um, so, yeah, there's like so many things that kind of, it, it's kind of like a, it happens stream with most, yeah, stream of consciousness and happens with a lot of my videos too, where I feel like there's a lot of happy accidents as well, where <laughs> like a thought will just like either randomly roll in or, you know, I'll be making something and I'll be like, oh, that looks cool. What can I extrapolate from this? Or I don't know, just, I feel blessed that just the whole thing came together nicely. Yeah, it's an amazing piece of art. And I think my favorite piece about it, and you talked about this in your like behind the scenes video was how the unicorn starts in like this desolate land and then moves into the world of Ethereum, which is like lush and rich. Talk about talk about that metaphor and, and why you think that that is a, a worthy metaphor to include in this uh, in this piece. Well, I mean, I think obviously Uniswap being so essential to the entire DeFi space and actually um, the like the whole Ethereum ecosystem, I think is um, sort of something that I wanted to convey in the video as well. So at least my take of it and, you know, the video is always also like open to some mm -hmm. degree of interpretation to the viewer as well. But um, my take of it is that sort of like, you know, when Uniswap was introduced to the whole DeFi space, like they kind of changed the game, right? Like they introduced all this like new possibility of exchanging different tokens and providing liquidity and stuff, which, um, so, you know, like the way I like said it in my video was like, oh, it's like a desolate land was maybe kind of like a stretch and exaggeration. Like obviously the land was rich already before that, but it's kind of like, yeah, like Uniswap kind of brought this whole, you know, um, ensemble of like innovation and just like, color you could say to the whole DeFi space and then so that's kind of what um sparked the idea and then really drove the sort of like narrative throughout the video and yeah so you know I, I did I did just always have the intention of making the video slightly like psychedelic <laughs> um, <laughs> which is why you know like the end of the result was like stuff swirling around too I mean I try to keep it a a theme throughout the entire video as well there's there was so so many things that I wanted to fit in the behind the scenes video but um right. I didn't want to make it too long because you know people like I wanted to keep it short and sweet but yeah like even there's like even down to tiny details like um that the saturation levels in the video from the beginning to the end uh change as well so it's like uh starts out a lot less saturated and then um 
it gets way more saturated towards the end, you know, as everything sort of like comes together, like um, the unicorn, Ethereum, and then there's like a pool underneath, which is also, you know, could be like a liquidity pool. And then the constellation above, like, you know, when everything comes together, it's like harmonious and colorful. So how long were you working on this piece before it was actually from start to finish? Actually, I think from ideation, it would be about a month and a half. Fortunately, I did um, have, I have like two artists who um, were able to sort of like, I was able to delegate some tasks mm -hmm. to um, and also help me out with like, so I had this artist, um, Hafid, who is a great X particles simulation artist. Um, that's like a, in case you're not like familiar with it, it's just like a, a specific sort of like task and within the animation pipeline mm -hmm. um and so he's really good at that so you know there, there, there were a lot of things like involving like particles and um simulated stuff in the video that um he uh did a phenomenal job with and i also had one of my old coworkers, like a girl that i and good friend that i used to work with and her name is marion super talented animator she's worked on like uh the new pokemon movie um <laughs> like animating the future and stuff did such a great job i asked um her to help me out with uh the sort of the movement of the unicorn and that's why you know it looks so smooth and amazing mm -hmm. that's all hats off to her so i was able to sort of just um focus on like directing and also obviously like i did everything else so you know like all the other like animating parts of it like assembling the scene like building some models and then also you know, like curating the entire look and palette, um, compositing, rendering, uh, post-production, all that kind of stuff. I think that definitely helped the production sort of like speed up a little bit. Um, but it was, I did like work a lot throughout this like month and a half, but mm -hmm. it was like, it was like really fun, which is why I put so many hours into it because right. I'm having fun. And I'm actually really glad that, you know, the people that I brought on board said that they also had a lot of fun. It's just, everybody had fun making it. And that's, I think that's like the main goal at the end of the day. Pro I think artistic products always come out looking a lot better when people are passionate about what they're doing. And that's, that's something I'm personally very hopeful about with what Ethereum can bring to the world around it is the opportunities to create value that people had fun creating along the way. Um, and I think that's a, this is a perfect manifestation of that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, this animation is almost a week old in the public's uh, sphere. And so, uh, you know, a week ago, none of this, none of this, all this news event hadn't, hadn't happened yet. So while you were, but you knew that you were going to NFT it, did you have any sort of like guess as to like how much this would go for on the secondary market before the actual NFT auction started? I had no idea. I mean, um, the, the NFT wasn't actually part of the original plan at all. It was just an idea that I had um sort of like halfway through production um it was also because I there were a lot of people who uh I had you know like I had been minting some NFTs like you know way like when we say way back in the day in crypto it's like not that long ago but like you know, bull markets yeah. always <laughs> so long. Um, but it was definitely you know like last year essentially mm -hmm. and then so um like I haven't, you know, because I, I've been sort of like so in, invested in the DeFi video eco space that, that I hadn't had time to sort of like dive into the NFT space. And obviously like NFTs like recently really blew up too. And um, there was like a tiny little bit of FOMO there, but also just like people constant, like always messaging me be like, why aren't you like selling any NFTs? Or like, why don't you mint NFTs? Like I would love to, you know, like Mm -hmm. buy your NFT or whatever and then I'm just like ah, I'm too busy like making videos <laughs> um and then I was like well why wouldn't I like double up on this you know but obviously I think um sort of like the the way I looked at it was just you know obviously the goal wasn't to make money but which is why I brought I, like it was all part of like I was just like to Uniswap I was like why don't we make this an NFT and like make it worthwhile which is donating it to a good cause like i have no idea how much we're gonna raise which is why we didn't also didn't like settle on like one specific charity yet because i was like 
I like, I don't want to promise like, oh, we can donate to three right. charities just in case I only sell it for like a hundred dollars and we can only like donate $30. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so, so like, it's like, it wouldn't even be worth a gas fee. So yeah, like that was kind of why, but I was like, you know, depending on how much we raise, then we can sort of like um, decide on how many we can actually lo- allocate to, which, you know, ended up obviously way exceeding my expectations. Like this whole Dow thing that just, I was like, I woke up, it was the, oh, we're going to get bid- into that for sure. <laughs> like the bidding war ended like in, in the morning of my time. And I woke up, I was like, there's suddenly like a Dow named after me. Like what happened? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let, let, let's get into that. So uh, the auction started on Thursday, my, my Thursday and, and, and then ended on Friday, which was your Saturday morning. Uh, and so the, then this massive bid, 100 ETH bid comes in from Andrew Kang. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure that was that was surprising. And then Leighton Cusack uh, signals on on Twitter saying, "Hey, who wants to like pool our capital together so we can buy this thing? Because we'll need to match. We'll need to beat this 100 ETH bid." Were you watching this happen, or were you asleep while this was going on? I saw his initial tweet about like, "Oh, does anybody want to get together a DAO?" Because um, Jameis had sent it to me, and then I was like, "Oh, that's cool." And I actually told Jameis too, I was like, I, I actually love, obviously I didn't, didn't know who was going to win the auction at the time, but I was just like, I actually love the idea of the video being owned by like the community, the same community that supported me, you know, from day one, right? Like that's awesome to me, at least I was like, and it almost feels like weird that, cause like, this is like the Unisob V3, like announcement video, obviously it was like a big deal when it came out too. So it's like, it almost feels weird if it like, just belong to one person or something mm-hmm. but I, I I was just thinking that it was a cool idea at the time I didn't know how they were going to do it um, I just knew that they were they were going to sort of something about that was happening but obviously you know I wasn't like involved in the channels or anything and then so mm-hmm. and then yeah like uh, when the 100 ETH bid came in um, I was just like okay this is already far exceeded my expectations <laughs> like literally I was having a conversation with um, Khalil the designer like you know uh, a few days before like we were about to drop the nft and then we were just checking out foundation and we saw this like one nft that sold for 10 ETH, and we're like wow 10 ETH, like that's amazing <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah so obviously when 100 ETH came in like it was just nuts and then everything else was even crazier <laughs> Right. So now this group of, I don't know how many of them there are, like 12, 15 people. They, now they have this, an actual DAO, like you said, named after you, please, please DAO. Uh, and when I was talking to Lace, Leighton, Leighton said that, well, um, th- this uh, pleaser DAO has excess ETH left over. And he doesn't know, like the, the DAO members, he thinks, doesn't really want any of their ETH back. And they actually want to like grow the DAO. But then what that means is that people pleaser, the artist needs to produce more art uh, for the DAO to have a purpose. So my question to you is, what's the future of your artwork as it relates to tokens on Ethereum? And and has this event changed that trajectory at all? It definitely has because um, I had always been also kind of cautious. I mean, or not even cautious because it never really even came to me that I would be minting these videos as NFTs because in my head, um, obviously always the IP would belong to the protocol who commissioned it in the first place, right? Which is why I'm obviously super grateful that uh, Uniswap were so supportive of this decision. They're like, yeah, um, you know, it's yours, like mint it. And then, but obviously the donation we're making together because um, this wouldn't have happened because of them. But um, yeah, I'm just like so grateful that they gave me this like chance to sort of um, broadcast my artwork to such a large audience as well. Um, Because DeFi I think was sort of like a more niche community before. Um, So, but hopefully, uh, you know, going forward, I I think I would like to sort of um, have a combination between minting my personal artwork um, and then also uh, definitely. But I think within, I also was having these ideas about, you know, even within my personal artwork, I want to still keep the same theme about, you know, putting in um, subtle references here and there to either DeFi um, or Ethereum ecosystem. And I think it would be a fun way for uh, people who are interested in um, the art to sort of look for those things as well. And 
you know, towards a broader audience, like just a general NFT audience, they'd just be like, oh, this is a cool animation or like a cool piece of art. But for um, the DeFi community, which is, you know, my OG <laughs> community, um, there's a, an extra meaning behind that where they can pick up on references to certain things that maybe other people wouldn't understand or just not know about. The fascinating thing to me about this story is that it is such a perfect, like, accidental orchestration of what makes <laughs> Ethereum so awesome. We have this application that is so powerful and in my opinion, like resonant with the values of Ethereum. We have this DAO, which collected many different people to, uh, to empower them to get something done that they wanted. And then we had the funding of cultural and artistic expression, which wouldn't have been, uh, been able to have been funded with half a million dollars to in, without this uh, medium. Uh, and then right before, the other coincidence about what happened is right before Vitalik on his blog put out this post about legitimacy and talked about how like NFTs and, and many other things uh, receive a lot of value because humans deem them to be legitimate. And when he explicitly said in this one paragraph about how uh, the creator of an NFT can help bless the value of an NFT by perhaps donating some of the revenue generated to a charitable cause that humans agree has uh, value. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that, I think by the time this blog piece had come out, you had already committed to donating uh, all of the revenue to charity. Uh, and so the fact that you were doing that without like the input from Vitalik, which many people just take Vitalik's input and run and runs with it. I think you did it with, with, with uh, by committing it before that was incredibly cool. And that just really just ties a great bow on this story. How do you, how do you think about that, that component of the story and how it kind of uh, impacted the, the story of this animation? I actually, yeah, I didn't know about it until I saw it in your tweet initially. Um, and it's, it's pretty crazy to me. I, everything about this whole situation is just seems like a crazy blessed coincidence almost mm -hmm. like, you know, including the Dow forming was unexpected. And then also I didn't um, prior know about this um, uh, Vitalik article and it's really just a very crazy coincidence and um, I'm glad that he sort of shares that value you know I really think that there's so much money going around in in crypto that we definitely have more than enough to sort of distribute it and put it towards something that's like worthwhile actually I was really inspired by uh, one of Chow Wang's um, tweets a while back, which I had retweeted, um, which he was talking about, um, sorry, I don't remember the exact quote, obviously, but he was basically talking about how um, nothing against trading, but just, oh, the act of trading is not necessarily like beneficial to society. Um, so, you know, instead of like flexing on, you know, material goods or something, you should flex on how you've helped other people financially. And um, I'm actually not a trader myself because I don't have time to do those things. Mm -hmm. But um, but I, I did feel very resonated with his tweet. Like his tweet was so inspiring. I was like, oh yeah, I think totally more people should be doing that in the space. And um, hats off to people who already are. And uh, I hope that, you know, I'm like, I'm not wealthy myself. So um, I was like, but I have this ability to sort of generate uh, like, you know, using my skill set to generate something that does have value, hopefully, and which turns out it did. Um, and I had always thought about um, wanting to do an NFT drop that was um, committed to charity, but I just never found the right sort of opportunity to. And to be quite honest, I was also a little bit scared to take that leap of faith because doing an auction is scary, right? It's... <laughs> Um, not something like a, this auction thing is not something that I've ever done before, but so I think, you know, with the sort of like support of Unisop, um, I felt a little bit more confident being like, okay, I think, you know, there's going to be at least I knew I had, you know, a, a, um, like a great community that I had always supported and were fans of my work, but I wasn't sure, you know, the valuation of that or anything at all. And so, yeah, this is just crazy. I'm super grateful. And I hope that this will also inspire more acts like this in the future as well. 
Yeah, yeah, that that last point, inspiring more acts like this, I think it's really important because there's a frequent line of conversation in the crypto space like, oh, cool, we're playing with these new financial assets, you know, everyone's getting hilariously rich, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then and then the, the question is like, well, what happens if we just create the same old institutions and same old structures that we came from, except now, like, great, now new people are rich. And my answer to this is always like, well, if we if we do want to have like a revolution in how society operates, it's not going to be just the technology, but it's going to be what how what people and and how people leverage this technology. And the the way that I see this truly being different is like the, there's a different cultural shared ethos of how we recirculate value. And like like mm -hmm. like to what you said, like trading one asset for another doesn't create value. Creating value creates value. And if we can re recirculate that value in ways that are better than on our previous system through a means such as NFTs, then that is something that is meaningfully different. And in, in my opinion, a much better improvement upon the way we used to do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, you know, Vitalik's point about how um, not just the legitimacy, but, you know, about how multiple people agreeing that something has value and then, you know, compounds its value essentially. And I think, yeah, and then his point about how, you know, when you put this to a good cause, it, I think it will definitely ampl amplify that um, value because mm -hmm. you're not only just people agreeing that this has value now, but that it's directly benefiting um, people who are in need, for example. Um, and I think that in itself is just so priceless. Um, so yeah, it was, he really hit the nail on the head with that article. Mm -hmm. For people pleaser, you hit the nail on the head with your animation, and so I could, I think I speak for ba basically all of uh, NFT speculators and Ethereum culturalists that we will watch your career with great interest. Uh, you have made a, a, in my opinion, a, a landmark event in the world of DeFi and NFTs, uh, and I hope this is the first of many. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs>